Okay, well, good morning. On behalf of our wonderful board of directors, our small but very enthusiastic staff, I'd say superhuman actually, because there's really only two of us, and a phenomenal conference committee. This is going to be a great conference, and they do it all on, as volunteers. I want to welcome you to this sold out. Please. <laughs> I want to welcome you to the sold out 2009 Online Journalism and Awards Banquet. We are so thrilled to see you all here, especially since I know that it was hard for a lot of you to get there, and we're going to make it worth every minute for you. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, we also want to uh, let you know that we're live streaming this, uh, so there's lots of folks who couldn't make it joining us, including an international contingent in London that I want to send a shout out to. Yay. Say hi. <laughs> And I hope they can manage to stay in their computers for, through the whole thing. I know it's a long slog for two days, but it'll be worth it. We're especially proud of this conference. It's being held in Tech Central, and it's the culmination of our 10-year anniversary. And 10 years seems like a drop in the bucket, but that's kind of like dog years in digital age. Uh, there's a, a lot that gets packed into 12 months, as all of you know. And in the decades since ONA was dreamed up by a group of online journalists who just somehow divined this tsunami was coming. The world of media has utterly changed. And as it was true 10 years ago, ONA is here now, to, not just to change with it, but to lead the change. We don't claim to have all the answers. There's way too many questions out there, some of them worth looking at, some of them not. But we do know that the talent, creativity, and the core values of the digital journalists that we have in our membership and who are going to be joining our membership and who are in this room right now are going to find those answers. And we know that because we see the excitement and hope every day when we talk to you on the phone, when we email with you. Uh, it's, it's truly in inspirational for us, and I hope we can help you in every way possible to do the jobs that are going to be very important for us to do in the next 10 years. Right now, I just want to introduce ONA Board President John Dube, who's going to catch you up on what we have planned for 2010. And again, I really thank you all for being here, and I want to applaud you. Good morning. All right. This is the most lively morning crowd I've seen yet. Um, as Jane mentioned, uh, we've had quite a year, and we've um, accomplished um, a tremendous amount in the past year um, for a number of reasons. The first um, thing that I think we accomplished in the past year that I think uh, more than anything um, I'm most proud of is the hiring of Jane uh, McDonald and Sherry Scalco who are our executive director and web editor and have really helped take this organization to another level. Um, so let me just give a you know, pause here for them. It, it's actually a quite momentous sort of move um, uh, step in our direction because we've, as you know, this is our 10th anniversary and we've been, you know, we started as a small organization um, run by a number of volunteers who made up board members and uh, over the past 10 years we've managed to grow this conference from a little itsy bitsy conference in the halls of Columbia University to what you see here today um, and we've also grown it from one that was really sort of carried on the backs of some volunteer board members to one that now has a two-person professional staff and we've really really um, been working hard in the last few years to professionalize this organization and I think that that's um, a big reason why we've been able to accomplish uh, so many of the things I'm about to talk about and so many of the things that we're going to be accomplishing uh, in the next year. Um, one of the things that we did in the past year that I did want to mention, which I think is really um, a really great thing, is the Support a Journalist campaign, which uh, we launched earlier this year in part because of the state of the economy. And we, um, thanks to the donations of many of you, gave away 54 ONA memberships to unemployed journalists. Um, <laughs> We also gave away uh, two free conference attendances um, and uh, flew two folks out here, Andrea Kusin and Jonathan Mandel, so that they could also join us here at this conference. Uh, 
I also just want to thank all of you because it's amazing in this year where other uh, associations have had to cancel their conferences that we not only have sold out, um, but in, you know, we have uh, this great turnout when I know from talking with many of you that many of your companies couldn't um, pay the way and that many of you are paying on your own way and really, really appreciate that and I know and I hope that you're all going to get um, far more than your money is worth out of this conference, so thank you for that. Another thing that we did in the past year was our Ownovations webinars in partnership with News University, which brought members uh, a number of free webinars um, throughout the year featuring cutting edge technology that's revolutionizing the way news is reported and produced. We are going to be expanding the depth and breadth of our training presentations next year through a partnership with Livestream.com, which, um, as Jan mentioned, is live streaming this conference right now. So um, it's one of many things that we're doing to sort of expand what we do outside of the conference and try to create sort of a year-round, uh, much more aggressive year-round programming and to do so um, virtually as well as in person. Um, without going into too many details, we've also had a ton of local events in the past year everywhere from, you know, a number of places in the U.S. to as you know overseas places such as Italy and London. Um, a big thank you to the international folks for helping to organize those events, and um, and hi for those of you watching uh, on Livestream.com in uh, London. Um, we also, as part of that, launched a new website, Journalist.org, in the past year, um, which has a number of features on it, um, including a great member directory and a, a ton of great resources from previous conferences. Um, so if you haven't really dove into that, I'd encourage you to check that out as well. Um, we've encouraged uh, a lot of member meetups, as I mentioned, um, and as Jane mentioned, um, you know, we've got a lot of things that we want to do in the year ahead. Um, you've made it clear to us that what you need to keep practicing journalism um, is to do so um, virtually and whatever it takes. So we're happy to tell you about a couple of new initiatives to serve our members and the role of digital journalists worldwide. Um, the, uh, you know, in this our anniversary year, we've been thinking about um, the eph ephemeral nature of digital media and the incredible work that's been produced, distributed, and uh, unfortunately lost throughout the years. So we're happy to announce uh, two things. One is um, what I think is a great partnership, starting with this year's Online Journalism Award winners. We are partnering with the museum in Washington, D.C. to highlight our award winners in an exhibit modeling the best in digital journalism. This month, the museum website and an interactive gallery kiosk in the actual museum are going to feature interviews with a select group of this year's OJA winners, chosen for their innovative take in online news, either in coverage, format, or technology used. Over the coming months, we plan to expand the exhibit to highlight milestones and innovations from a decade of achievement, using the work and commentary of previous OJA winners with the help of our OJA partner, which is also new this year, the University of Miami School of Communication. And a big thank you to them for the awards winners, for helping us, uh, and the judges for helping us figure out the awards winners this year, which is an amazing group that you will be hearing about uh, in our awards banquet uh, the final night. As we work to save important journalism for posterity, we know members are looking for real-time help. So we're delighted to announce um, yet another big initiative um, in the next year. We received a $50,000 grant from the Gannett Foundation to seed our parachute training program, launching with a full day of free intensive workshops in Ann Arbor, Michigan later this month. This is customized training that's targeted to areas hard hit by media closures and job losses and will bring together digital journalists of all stripes to learn from experts and from each other. It will be tailored specifically to the needs of 100 independent, community, nonprofit, displaced, and employed journalists, bloggers, and entrepreneurs in the area. We hope that it will grow to contribute to keeping a strong media presence in communities, states, and across the globe. The media industry is seeing more entrepreneurs and startups searching for new ways to produce journalism. To help ease the financial burdens of independent journalism, ONA is also with wor working with one of the leading libel insurers in the United States to offer low-cost, reliable media liability coverage. We're going to be posting a survey online shortly. 
and we encourage all interested to take it so we can assess your needs and formulate an insurance program for 2010. So if you're at all interested in this or even know of people interested, please do take that survey. It's very important that we get that information so that we can make sure that this program happens and does so in a way that's most valuable to both our current members and to people who we think we would, um, who might be future members and find this useful. Lastly, um, and I promise Ev will be coming up to the stage soon. We recently held our 2010 Board of Directors election and voters kept five current members on the board and added two wonderful new members. I just wanted to mention our two new members, um, Meredith Artley, who just joined CNN.com as Vice President and Managing Editor. <laughs> and Liz Lufkin, the Senior Director at Yahoo for Front Page Programming, who I'll embarrass momentarily. Now, the time for thank yous. Um, we wouldn't re be here right now um, if it wasn't for our conference committee and all of the volunteers who worked overtime because they knew how important it is um, that your digital skills are not only kept up to speed, but ahead of the curve. So please, a big round of applause for everyone who volunteered to help out this year. Um, now, uh, I just wanted to ask very quickly um, our co-chairs of this um, conference, Catherine Fong, um, who's the editor and publisher of Scene Magazine, and uh, Liz Lufkin to stand just so that we can embarrass them just a little bit more. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, as I mentioned, I think we've done a lot in the past year and we're going to be doing even more in the next year. Um, we would love any ideas uh, if anyone has of other initiatives that we should be pursuing and we would also love anyone who is interested in helping out to uh, let myself or Jane or others know. Now I'd like to ask Liz to put on her conference chair hat and come up to introduce Ev Williams from Twitter. Thank you. Wow, there's a lot of people here. This is great. I am really thrilled to uh, uh, welcome Ev Williams, uh, co-founder of Twitter, as our opening keynote speaker. Some of you may recall last year when Robert Scoble talked about this cool new tool called Twitter, a uh, great way to gather information. Um, since then, of course, Twitter has become part of the uh, popular vernacular. Um, everyone from Ashton and Demi, Oprah and Shaq, CNN and Facebook is Twittering away. Uh, it's been used to record off-the-record remarks by President Obama and also, more seriously, to cover uh, the uh, shootings in Mumbai. It's a true Silicon Valley success story and it really exemplifies the theme of this year's conference, which is being at the sweet spot of journalism and technology. What's interesting to me about Williams is that in addition to being uh, creative and entrepreneurial, he is obviously really flexible and it's a, a good lesson for all of us. I know I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. Uh, his first big success, Blogger, was um, a spin-off of some project management software. And Twitter was developed at Obvious Corp, which was originally more focused on podcasting than in communicating in 140 characters or less. Interviewing him today is Susan Murnett. Susan is chair of this uh, year's keynote speakers committee and she organized the entrepreneurial pitch session 6 and 60 which is later this afternoon and I hope you all check that out. Susan's career has spanned everything from being a poetry editor, which I found out yesterday, to uh, VP of programming at AOL. More recently, she has worked at the Night News Challenge and the Center for Investigative Reporting. She appears to know everyone who is anyone in the Silicon Valley. If you haven't met her, do so. It's a great networking opportunity. And she also has the entrepreneurial spirit. Her latest project is founding Oakland Local, which launches next week. Please join me in welcoming Ev Williams and Susan Murnett. to have an intimate conversation in public. Thank you for coming to talk to us. My pleasure. Thanks. 
One of the things that I think has amazed everyone and been really exciting is how international Twitter's become. Can you talk to us a little bit about some of the countries where there's active use and maybe some surprises? Sure. Um, Twitter's about 60% uh, international in terms of use today. We expect that to be a lot greater as we're doing a bunch of more efforts to make it more international. We had a very early spike in Japan. We don't know why. Um, especially because we didn't have SMS coverage in Japan. In fact, they don't really use SMS, they use email instead on their phones. And, but, but a certain group took off using Twitter in Japan very early, so we, we translated to Japanese. That's the only other language we've translated into currently, but big countries for us right now are the UK, um, Brazil has grown a lot very recently, um, Canada, and then some of the usual suspects in uh, Western Europe. Are there countries where Twitter use has surprised you in terms of uh, that country's not a leader in using other kinds of technology and Twitter's actually taken hold to a greater extent that maybe you would have expected? Uh, well, there's certainly been a lot of surprises. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's in comparison to how they've used other technologies, but, but certainly when we we woke up and saw Mumbai trending on, on Twitter and, and hearing about what was happening there last November. That was a surprise. We didn't even know we had users there. Um, the, the situation in, in Iran was, was surprising as well and how much it was actually used there. Um, and actually, you know, clearly gratifying for us. That was actually the other thing that I think when I crowdsourced these questions a lot of people wanted to know about. Um, we're all journalists and the whole way that Twitter has taken hold as a, a tool for breaking news is something that everyone here wanted you to talk about a little more. I think it would be great just to hear a little bit about some of the uses that um, impressed you and some of the ways that Twitter um, actually became a participant in some of the stories kind of on the back end. Okay, uh, well, in, in terms of Twitter being a tool for breaking news, it's you know, clearly if you give someone something that allows them to send a message to lots of people very quickly, uh, then they talk about what's going on around them, then, then you'll, you'll break news. Uh, and that's, that's something we've, we've been seeing many, many times. Usually it's not something as dramatic as planes landing in the Hudson, but once in a while that type of thing happens. Uh, and that's um, that's very cool, but the, there's also a piece of that that I think as journalists that we don't confuse ourselves that that's the same thing as actually reporting on the news, and we think that um, what journalists do is very complementary to what individuals do in um, sending these little bits of information. They still need to be, in order to be really comprehensible about what's going on, they need to be um, used as clues, and maybe they're a first indication, but, but there needs to be some, some thoughtful um, analysis and summarization that goes around that. How much um, are there ways that you would like to see journalists using Twitter more, but you don't think have started to happen yet? Um, you're kind of the core Twitter user because you're the leader of the company. Mm -hmm. um, are there ways that you think Twitter will emerge more as a journalist tool that maybe you're just starting to see happen or you want sure. to sort of help people understand? Yeah, I think there's a bunch of ways that we are seeing happening, but, but we'd like to see a lot more is um, the first one is there, there's sort of phases of, of Twitter use, I think, for, for journalists or news organizations. <clears throat> the first is where a lot of people get started is they're writing stuff on the web and they, they send, send links out via Twitter. And, and that's useful and will get you more traffic probably. And then there's the next step is kind of reporting in between the stories. Um, whether it's about what you're working on or if you're at a um, sort, of, sort of event where, where you want to send out little tidbits of information um, such as at this event or you're covering something um, and speed is of importance, then Twitter can be a useful publishing platform for that and then you may summarize that later in, in your regular formats. Uh, another way that actually caught on pretty early and probably most people here are aware of is using Twitter as a research tool. Yeah. Um, both to identify things that may be happening um, that you want to look into more, finding sources, asking questions. Uh, that can be very powerful and um, complementary to what people do. And then 
a big one that we're just starting to see more now is taking all this data and content that's being created on Twitter and really um, sifting out the, the signal from the noise. And um, we're excited about what journalists can bring to that and news organizations because there's so much data now. And um, we, we're working on relevancy and, and search and finding, helping people find the stuff that's most interesting to them. But we see journalists is offering a big service in that discovery process. So what's the most interesting stuff or relevant stuff that's happening among all these millions of users that, that you can pull out and summarize and, and um, present to your audience? So I think what you're talking about, just tell me if this is correct, is um, not only curating a conversation, there's been a lot of examples of people pulling out Twitter search terms and building mm -hmm. pages for them, but actually then starting to analyze and reflect and take that uh, sifting through all the uh, search results and the content kind of a step further. Is that Yeah, well it's both really. I think the, the curating still could, is, is powerful as a, and can augment um, stories on, on the web with, with live data and live opinion, but the curating is really key and I think there's a lot more to be done in that, either selecting um, lists. We, we actually launched a new feature that can help with curating, uh, which I can talk about, um, but there's more you could imagine that uh, if we can give journalists better and better tools to, to pull out stuff from this endless stream um, and then if they do the analysis on top of that, that's great. But just, just the pulling out and the editing, I think, is, offers a lot of value. I, I would love to have you talk about the list, but before we move to that, I think if maybe there are any examples of curating or of journalistic reflection that kind of you know, stand, um, stand out for you or come to mind, uh, touching on them would be great, just so we can have some examples that we can all go look up later. Uh, well, the Huffington Post has been a, a leader in this area. They, they've curated whitelists and are, are pulling out, um, basically presenting streams of stuff. Um, there's uh, many more examples that okay. I'm, I'm blanking on. <laughs> but um, the New York Times, I believe, has is, is done some more Twitter integration. And as far as the analysis, um, I'm not sure of any good examples, but I'm sure there are yeah. some. We're going to all go look at the Huffington yes. Post. <laughs> um, I'd love to have you talk a little bit more about lists, uh, both as a feature in terms of what made you decide to launch it. Um, one of the things I think is fascinating about Twitter is that you have so many inputs and there is so much crowdsourcing around Twitter. So to what extent that played a part in deciding to develop lists as opposed mm -hmm. to another feature? And then lists as a journalistic resource. I'd love to hear you talk about both of those. Sure. So what lists are? Uh, if you may not have seen, is a, is a new feature that we've, um, is in testing right now. It's not widely available. But it basically lets you curate a list or a collection of Twitter accounts uh, and then it presents that as a timeline as if you're following all those people, but it creates a public page out of it. And uh, so, for instance, we created a list of everybody who works at Twitter and you can see that stream. You could create a list of um, the, your favorite journalists on Twitter or baseball players or funny people or, or whatever it is and it's a way to help uh, to crowdsource it, it does a few things one is it, when you create a list it lets you um, follow or, or filter down to just those people if you're following them um, and then so it's about controlling the information flow which is a problem that as more and more people get on Twitter um, and you, you're interested in them, you need ways to filter and control that information flow. But secondly, it helps for discovery of, of content. So you could have a list, for example, of everybody at this conference, see what everybody was saying, um, besides just doing a search for, that, for the hashtag. Um, and um, what that allows is a lot of discovery of both people and content that you may not otherwise be aware of. So we're, we're really excited about that because it's been one of the biggest issues with Twitter is you know there's stuff going on in there, uh, but, but where is it? And if we can, um, we launched a feature that suggested users mm -hmm. a few months ago just to scratch the, the surface of trying to, to solve this problem for new users because we had people signing up and they didn't know where to start. Uh, but this is a leap beyond that because we don't think it's our job to editorialize. It should be, anyone should have that ability and then if they 
Um, so a lot of uh, media organizations are actually, or um, journalists themselves, we expect to curate this list, and or these lists, and they that will be a, a value add, just like editing is a value add, yeah. um, and and hopefully it'll go nuts. So I think a lot of people here probably saw, or I hope you did, the really. Uh, hysterical and wonderful Robert Scoble list of uh, people who are not on the suggested users list of Twitter who should be and then right afterwards you announced lists and it it felt completely magic like <laughs> wow you know did you did you talk to Robert and um, was 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 list something that uh, the market people like Dave Weiner or Robert helped you think about in terms of the writing they were doing. Um, how, what what kind of were some of the factors that made you decide to develop this feature? Uh, well, those guys are are always thinking ahead, and uh, it was you know we kind of came to the same conclusions okay. very early. As as I said, the suggested users we knew was not an ideal solution ever, and. Um, we always wanted to do something better. And this was actually a fairly early idea for Twitter. When you, when you start these things, you kind of think of all the things you want to do for the next 25 years in the first 25 days, and then right. you, it takes it's that long better. to do them. Yeah. Uh, so it, we, were, we were really wanting to do it for a long time. And, um, and this version that we'll launch uh, in a couple weeks, hopefully, is, is just the first version. So there's a lot of, a lot of things that, that Robert and Dave Weiner will probably say, well, now they've got to do this. I can't believe they haven't done that yet, but we'll get there. So, so one last question about lists before we move on. Um, right now, Twitter is really kind of two pages. It's, it's the, main, the mainstream and it's your profile. Is this going to make Twitter a bigger site and that people will be kind of indexing and looking up um, all of these different lists, both the ones they've made for themselves and that they're sharing right on Twitter? Mm -hmm. um, it'll definitely make it a bigger site at twitter.com uh, because there'll be tons probably millions of lists soon and and but the other thing is we don't think of Twitter as a site right. uh, as, as you know Twitter is a network and we don't consider twitter.com a preferred way of, of viewing or creating tweets we we think it's best when it's distributed in all kinds of contexts whether that's uh, as an app on your mobile phone or as a widget on a media site and uh, the list content, like everything else, will will be um, available through the API or and through widgets that that um, journalists or media organizations can take and put on their site and and put beside their content and integrate in in interesting ways or pull out via the API and um, so that'll make it much more powerful. I could ask you a million more questions about this, but I'm going to move on because right. I'm a product geek. Um, where do you see Twitter in a year? Um, you're, you're moving so quickly and there's so much growth. Um, I know that just keeping the infrastructure going is a challenge, but a year from now, what are some of the things you'd like to say Twitter accomplished? Um, the number one thing for us is to improve the product and technology so it becomes more useful in people's daily lives. And uh, that will spur growth, which is still a priority, but um, we feel like we've only scratched the surface of what it can do for people and how it's useful. In certain contexts, Twitter is super valuable. So at, at an event, for instance, and we saw this early on, we discovered um, actually at South by Southwest 2007, we kind of made a shift mentally from, okay, Twitter is this social thing that you kind of keep in touch with your friends with, to Twitter can be a utility, and it's not just about friends, it, it's about adding this information layer to an event, for instance, that makes it more valuable. And we've seen that, of course, many times now, whether it's a, a news event or a sporting event or, or a conference, and, um, but there's all kinds of other situations in which Twitter gives you the information you need to know or lets you share information that other people need to know very quickly and and we want to just make that much better so if it's um, if you're walking down the street and want to know what's happening around you you can find out by bringing up your phone and doing very little work if you want to get a message to um, you know the little league team right. about about the games canceled Twitter is the easiest way to do that 
um, whatever it is that that people need to do, we want to make them more productive, more more efficient, and more more aware and connected. And so there's lots of features, lots of technology that comes out of that, and that's on our roadmap. Are, are you thinking about um, working on some of uh, the group messaging technologies? Uh, uh, do you, anything specific you mean by um, that? Or? Well, you know, one of the things that um, people have always talked about is how messaging a group on Twitter can involve somewhat elaborate commands and most uh -huh. people don't do it. They, mm -hmm. they just message the people. Right. So I wondered if that was one of the features that mm -hmm. you had sure. requests for. Sure. Um, that's sort of a, a natural thing that um, people need it, to move beyond the I send a message out and everybody picks right. it up. Maybe I want it to be a little bit more private or maybe I don't want to bother all those people. Right. Uh, I certainly have that feeling yeah. daily. So we, it's been that was our number one request, I think, two years ago. Mm -hmm. Lists are a stepping stone to that, actually. Okay. So you can imagine um, now you can read yeah. Yeah. a list. Got it. Yeah. 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 So you you can make you can make a list that leads to being able to make a group. Right. Then you can start to sort and send more precisely. Yeah. I'm not announcing any features, but right. you can imagine. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> you can imagine the evolution of these things. Yeah. Um, that's a segue into probably the question that um, you probably hate getting asked the most. So I'm going to ask you that question now. Um, you know, to me, when I hear that, I hear premium service and mm -hmm. added features that, you know, as Twitter becomes more and more indispensable, um, you're going to pay for it. I'm not going to ask you about that, but I'm going to ask you the question everyone asks, which is, you know, um, how do you see your business model emerging? Um, talk a little bit to us about the fact that the press has given you a big valua valuation. Everyone loves Twitter, but you've been able to put off issues about immediate revenue. I know you're thinking about it really hard. It's mm -hmm. obvious. But just talk about that, that nexus of, of things a little bit. Um, everyone here is on a tight budget. Newspapers notoriously cash straps. So in some ways, people look at you with envy. So, you know, talk a little bit about kind of both the pressure to um, demonstrate you're going to make revenue and then maybe kind of where you see your plans going mm -hmm. uh, and what might happen. Sure. Um, well, first, you shouldn't look at us with envy because we, no matter what, we make less money than you do. But <laughs> uh, we'll have to fix that eventually. Um, we're <laughs> the, the truth is that... First, the thinking about, about that and why we haven't yet is simply because we think the opportunity is, is much bigger and we're still a small company. We're about 80 people, I learned small. to my surprise yesterday. Um, <laughs> I thought we were smaller. To a lot of people, are like, you're, only, you're only 80 people. But um, that's simply not enough people to, to do what we're trying to do and do it well. And so uh, building the technology, supporting the infrastructure, making the product better and better, and supporting just, just keeping it the way it is for millions of users and growing very quickly yeah. is, is a hard job. That, that team is very stretched. So building a business on top of that um, is a whole nother team, you know, at least the same size. Totally. So when it comes to our, our prioritization, uh, we value the things that that secure you know, Twitter as the best way to do what Twitter does and, and helps it continue to grow as long as we can pay for that. Obviously, paying for that is a necessity. Unfortunately, we've had investors who see that long-term vision and are there with us and say, you know what, focus on, on building the value for, for a while. So that, having said that, they also wouldn't have invested if they didn't see the potential for Twitter <laughs> as a business. And, um, I won't go into too much detail as to what we think that potential is, but the, the things we usually point out is that um, like lots of mediums, if, if you're driving lots of attention and you know a lot about what people are interested in, um, there are traditional ways to make money off of that. Uh, there's also a lot of commercial usage happening on the platform today, so it's not all it's not like instant messaging, which is, was kind of hard to monetize because it's just friends talking back and forth. Uh, Twitter is used in business context a lot today. And that's some of our most exciting usage to me, not just because it can potentially make us money, but because it's a way that actually adds value to people. So 
hundreds of thousands of people sign up to get Dell's offers for discounts because they're scarce information and they save them money. Uh, and and more interesting is where it, it it gives for small local businesses, for instance, like the bakery is like tweets when the, the fresh cookies are coming out of the Koji's oven. Koji's truck in LA. Koji's truck in LA, and all the food carts that are now becoming uh, very popular in San Francisco, Twitter where they're at. And so offering this communication channel between businesses and, and their customers mm -hmm. that never existed before, it's not, it's not like, well, a better way to send traffic to your website or another way besides AdWords or something. It's something that never existed before that uh, can help businesses, can help their customers, and can make people more productive and efficient. Uh, that's exciting to us, and that's the type of thing we want to support. And if we can really add that value for businesses, then I'm not too worried about our ability to make it pay for us. I think that was a great answer, and it kind of brings me to a little bit of a segue, which is really about lessons learned as an entrepreneur. Um, I have a lot of friends who are on the blogger team and one of the things that people said to me in more recent years is looking back they wish that blogger hadn't sold to Google and things might have gone differently if blogger hadn't sold to Google and you know one of the things that you have is the benefit with Twitter of having done other startups and having had traction and I would love to just hear a little bit about you know, what are some of the things you resolved that you wanted Twitter to do or not do, um, having gone through other businesses and having had the chance to look back and say, oh, I would have done this differently, I would have done that differently. How did having those past experiences help you kind of form certain assumptions or resolve about how you wanted Twitter to grow? Well, first of all, I don't regret the blogger sold to Google, right. but um, I can understand that perspective. and. Acquisitions are are often tricky because um, you know you have a different different priorities in different contexts and and certainly not as much freedom. But unfortunately, you can't run the experiment both ways and see which one would have been better. Um, Google was a great place to be, and um, I learned a lot there. A lot of stuff that <clears throat> enabled me to do what we're doing at Twitter today. I think and. Um, so, so that was very valuable, but it was my, I've started about a half dozen internet companies since 1994. Um, Blogger, Pyro is the only one you've heard of because, um, you know, that's the, the odds, but right. um, it, it was all very useful to lead to what we're doing with Twitter and um, part of that is, is just thinking uh, when you when you've had that many experiences, what's the, had a, the effect it's had on me is wanting to do something really, really big as mm -hmm. part of it. Um, but we didn't start Twitter thinking, well, we want to do something really, really big. I mean, everybody wants to do something big. It happened that, that Twitter has that potential. Um, and Twitter wasn't even my idea. It was a side project of Odeo, the last company I was running. Um, yeah. And Jack Dorsey, my co-founder and former CEO of Twitter, something he's been thinking about for a while. And we kind of stumbled into it and eventually realized, hey, this is a really big deal. And once we realized it's a really big deal, uh, my interest was in just realizing that potential. And um, that, you know, that kind of goes to building a really great company as part of that as well, having started a bunch of companies and worked in, in good and bad companies. Uh, we're very focused on not only building a great service and making it big, but building a great organization. Mm -hmm. uh, just as an entrepreneur and someone who's thought about business for most of my life, I care deeply about the company and the aspects and the culture of the company, not just the success of the, of the, right. the product and the business. Uh, so that's, I won't get into too much detail about how that's changing our company or how we're thinking, but it's mostly about thinking long term um, and you know, being very careful about who we hire and what kind of culture we're building, um, and that's that's definitely a big focus for us. I think the whole idea of rules that you make for yourself as an entrepreneur and how you learn from past experiences is is really interesting. Um, it's something that that I'm always thinking about in terms of media entrepreneurship, um, having a great team, being very careful about who you hire. 
um, trying to have a coherent vision. Those are good rules. Are there any other rules that you have for yourself that you think might be helpful to people in the audience who are starting to think themselves about, oh, I might want to start my own thing on the net, or maybe I should try to find a developer to you know, experiment with? Sure. Um, I have some rules. Um, one, one thing that we try and keep in mind is to uh, assume we don't know what's going to happen and, and therefore not try to get too clever about what we're doing. Uh, we've learned time and time again that, that things don't work as, as you expect them to, especially on the web and especially when you're trying to invent something new and, in, um, and you kind of leave it up to the world to determine if it works. Uh, so what we try to do now with every feature we develop or how we think about things is plant seeds and, um, and see, see what grows out of them and then try to water them and, and keep them healthy. And that's, that's one of the ways that we've been really fortunate with Twitter is, is we planted the right seeds and then and in fertile ground and people, both users and developers and organizations have taken to that and made, you know, taught us what Twitter should be. And we've tried to be very open to that. And I think there could be another approach to that that says, no, here's what it should be. This is, this is better. Uh, and that doesn't really work. It's, it's not up to you at that point. Um, you, can, you can shape it and we, you know, we'll do things that um, we're not strictly, we won't strictly adhere to you know, the majority rule because we think there's um, some choices you have to make that aren't going to please everybody. But um, that's one thing. It's just not, not assume you know what's going to happen and, and don't try to get too clever. Um, the, well, that's just one rule. It's the only one I can think of. Okay. Um, another, another question, um, which is related more to making choices and knowing when to let go. Um, you know, I think that what you said about there's so many features we thought of, we can only execute, you know, in a certain uh, uh, roadmap, and it, it's going to take time, is true for everybody. As journalists, we're always deciding what stories to invest in and what to run. Um, how do you know when to fold? You know, how do you know when to let go of something? Um, I'm sure you've had, uh, you know, failures that were painful and things you love that you decided not to pursue. How do you know when to move on? Um, mm -hmm. If there's not some next great thing and you just have to kind of make that choice, um, how do you do that? Um, I've certainly had many failures I've, I've moved on from, some at the right time, some too late. Um, hard to tell if any too early. But the thing for me that's the best guide is just, just going with, with my gut mm -hmm. and try not to get too caught up in, in what the external world is telling you. Uh, one example is with Odeo, the, the podcasting company I started that Twitter spun out of. Uh, that was something that I that made a lot of sense intellectually uh, early on, and we got kind of swept up in the, the hype that was podcasting at the time. Right. And a lot of the assumptions we made were actually valid. Uh, like a lot of things, it would take longer to realize that than initially thought. But uh, I think a lot of what we were trying to do with Odeo was legitimate. Um, we were surprised that Apple released a lot of what we were trying to do um, into iTunes automatically, so um, as soon as they did. But after a while, it wasn't that we didn't see a potential path to success there. It was that I wasn't as excited about that path to success than doing something else. Or I just wasn't excited. It wasn't that I even had a thing. Twitter, we did start inside of Odeo. And we, um, but the big, it wasn't taking off while we were still running Odeo. It was, it was basically fell flat for a while. But we felt something with Twitter that we didn't feel with Odeo, mm -hmm. at least for us. And um, that, made all the, that made all the difference. That, and that's what allowed me to say, you know what, if I think out three years and, and we get Odeo to where we want to be, or you know, does that excite me as much as, as it wasn't even Twitter at the time, as potentially doing something else. And I just didn't feel it. And I thought it's better to, to cut the cord now um, than, than to try that. Um, there's a great book called The Dip by, by Seth Godin, I think, okay. about. Um, he has this great analogy about 
how um, when you start on something, there's always it goes for a while up, and then it gets to a hard part, and and you everything that works it dips and then eventually succeeds. But when you're in the dip, you can't tell if if you're in the dip or you're in a cul-de-sac. If you're in a cul-de-sac, you need to you need to stop and and you know drive out. Uh, if you're in a dip, you need to keep going. Um, so I highly recommend the book. I, I want to read it now because as you've been talking, I've been thinking about the times when Twitter was having all the infrastructure problems mm -hmm. and how humiliating it must have been and frustrating to be failing in public to have so much demand mm -hmm. that you couldn't meet. Um, did you know that was a dip? Yeah. It's easy to say yes, you know, in retrospect. Um, we never considered stopping Twitter. I think I knew it was a dip. For me, it was sort of um, it was familiar territory, although it was terrible territory, <laughs> um, which made it more embarrassing that, you know, Blogger, we had very similar problems yeah. in um, 99, 2000, um, and that was a serious dip that, that I went through, and not only with the technology, with Twitter, it was just the technology wasn't working. Um, the, the company was never in trouble because we had enough money, but with Blogger, both the technology was failing and, and we didn't have any money. Um, and it got pretty dire to the point where we asked our users to, to give us some money for this free product so we could go buy some servers. Right. Um, and, you know, thankfully that worked. But there are some very dark times with that. Yeah. And, um, but it was kind of the same thing. It was, it was, there was something I just knew in my gut in both cases and the team knew that this was worth doing. And the other thing with, with Blogger, and I, I think with Twitter as well, is as embarrassing as it is to go through those, those times, um, the alternative is worse. I, mean, I just, in those cases... Spell that out a little bit. <laughs> well, for Blogger, I was like, well, what the hell else am I going to do, is, is the question. And um, yeah. even, so worst case scenario was that just ran it into the ground and it got more and more painful until it stopped. Right. But um, that was that didn't seem less painful than just stopping then and giving up. Yeah. And the that would probably be more painful longer term because right. there'd be this question and, yep. and potential regret. And I just I think I had too much ego at the time too to say, well, yes, I am publicly failing, but screw you, I'm going to make it work. Right. And, <laughs> Um, I think we had a little bit of that at Twitter too. Is like you know, I I get motivated somewhat by by the world telling me I'm going to fail. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, another segue. When I was doing research and thinking about questions to ask you, I read the Inc. magazine article where you talked about some of your qualities as an entrepreneur, and the one that struck me was you talked about one of your strengths being able to manage uncertainty. And I think that it would be great for this audience to talk a little bit about, you know, how has that served you well? How do you use that ability to live with uncertainty? You've certainly mentioned, mentioned lots of instances, but, but in a more macro way, um, how, do you, how, do you, how do you work that to your advantage? How is that a strength in terms of starting new things and then getting things off the ground? Uh, well, I think it's it's absolutely necessary starting new things that you embrace uncertainty, and I've I've always gotten questions um, from employees or or some um, people I work with. Some people say I, I don't know where we're going. Um, we should know where we're going, and it's like it's sort of the nature of the game that you don't know where you're going. It doesn't bother me a great deal. You can still. That's not an excuse for not having a vision where you want to go, um, but you don't know what it's going to look like, and you know your vision is wrong in some ways. And um, that's, I think, if I wasn't comfortable with that, then I wouldn't have done m most of the things I've done. And there are different kinds of businesses, and there are different kinds of of entrepreneurs who don't. There's people who are less. You know, probably smarter people who go into more certain territory. Um, I'm attracted to the things that are more unknown. So mm -hmm. blogging was pretty unknown in 1999 yeah, I and I was wrong about all of it, but you know, charged ahead. Yeah. And you know, Twitter 
with the Jack may have, may have known where it was going, but I certainly didn't. And um, it's just a requirement that if you if you have something that you just think is intriguing, um, and for me, it's always my own reaction to it. And that's going back to um, not listening too much to what the external voices say, because if if you listen to that too much, then nothing great ever comes from that. And, you, and what I always do is say, well, do I like this thing that we're creating? And do I want it to see, do I want to see it exist in the world? And if, if so, then it's worth doing. And I'll keep working on it even if I don't know how it's going to go. So, so you have a certain stubbornness and persistence that goes with that. Okay. About what you're doing. And um, you just have to uh, filter out who you want to listen to and who you don't. Yeah. I certainly would be delusional if I only listened to myself as well. A a absolutely. Um, last question, and then maybe we'll open it up to um, questions from the um, audience. But the theme of the conference is reinvention. And as I said earlier, a lot of people here are dealing with a lot of uncertainty about their jobs, or thinking about um, starting new careers, or thinking about more entrepreneurial paths. Um, as someone who's had many startups and now is having a very public and exciting success building something brand new, um, what, what's advice that you would give to, to this audience about how to develop ideas, how to think about what they might do next, um, uh, personal traits to try to strengthen to take a path that's not so much about the nine to five? Wow. Um, I, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is to, to start small. Uh, don't try to have everything figured out. Kind of going back to assuming you don't know what's going to happen. When I talk to entrepreneurs, a lot of times, most of the time, the most valuable advice I can give them is, is to focus. If they show me what they're doing, it's, it usually has you know, seven components when it should have three or three components and it should have one. Uh, that time after time is is an error, I think, when people try to try to create something. It's like, it has to do all these things, otherwise it's not worthwhile. And that really sets you up for, for failure. And it can always be more later, but, but start with one right. thing, or one idea, or one incremental improvement. Uh, and the, the other thing would be, uh, to repeat myself, but, but create something you want to see in the world, uh, rather than, something that, that you think you've done a lot of analysis and, and your MBA friend tells you there's, there's a market for. Right. Yeah. Um, and then just, you know, there's a lot to be said for, for um, being willing to fail as well. And how important is it to build a team? Um, is finding other people to partner with essential? Do you think there's an optimal number if you have an option? I think that's kind of a, a personal thing. I don't, I wouldn't get too caught up in that, but teams can be super um, valuable, and there's some data that says that companies started with, with two co-founders are, are usually more successful than those started with one. Uh, but the beauty about the, the ecosystem that exists with the internet today is that you can start things with very little resources and, and very few people. Um, there's great platforms for, for doing all kinds of stuff, and if you need to develop technology and you don't know how to do that, you can, you can go to, to sites like Renacoder or Odesk and find a technologist. And um, that's, that's actually how uh, Kevin Rose started Dig. He, and, um, and other successes that have happened that way. So there's always a way to do it. And uh, having a team is great, but the, I wouldn't emphasize that too much because I think a bigger error is um, partnering with the wrong people because you think you need partners. Um, and you know, I've, I've done a little, little bit of that myself. So um, you have to really, really be careful, especially early on, with, with who you involve. I think that's good advice. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, do people have questions that they would like to ask Ev?
Um, speaking of failing in public and not being able to meet demand, we had a little problem with our live streaming because I think everybody here is probably online, I'm pretty sure. Um, so I'm, I apologize very much to the folks who couldn't get live streaming initially. We are back on and hopefully you caught most of what Ev had to say, which was really helpful. <laughs> okay, so we are going to take questions and there's, I think, two wireless mics in the room somewhere if they can share where they are. Just put your hand up if you want to uh, ask Ev a question and we'll have somebody over to you. Hi, um, quick question here. Um, we, my can organization. You, can you maybe just say who you are if you don't oh, I'm mind. Russ Walker from grist.org. Hi, everybody. Um, just had a quick question about the APIs that you all are making available. It's great. We're, we're investing a lot of time and energy in building applications for our website off of them. Is there ever a time in the future where using those APIs won't be free? Um, I don't think so. With, we have thrived because of the APIs and as I said earlier, the Twitter is really an ecosystem and having lots of in and out points is essential to what Twitter is and does. We do want to put more structure around um, and some guidelines around how to use them, but I think that should only help, um, help people invest in them because we want to make clear there are uses that we wouldn't be cool with if you're... Um, uh, we, we want to protect both our interests and, and the user's interests who actually are creating and, and own the content. And we've recently updated our terms of service for users that, that spell out some guidelines, but really underscore that this stuff, the stuff you create on Twitter you own, but it may be picked up and it may show up in all kinds of places. Uh, and, and hopefully that gives you more confidence to invest in the APIs. Um, but what's important to us is, is just that, that things are used in, in positive ways and um, you know, Twitter gets attribution, users get attribution. Um, and the only reason we would charge for APIs, is that I think it's very unlikely with anything that um, is available today we would charge for. Um, if someone figures out a way to take Twitter content and make tons of money off of it, we may say, hey, you know, let's, let's uh, work out a deal, but we'd still want you to do it. Uh, and Chloe Sladden, who is here, is actually runs our media partnerships, and she's going to be here at least for a little while today. Um, and she'd be happy to talk to you about that. Other questions? Is that? Are you on? Uh, there's a gentleman uh, right there. There's yeah. one. There's one with a mic back in the middle. Oh, I can ask if it's all right. Sure. Um, my name is Joel Schwartzberg. I'm with Now on PBS. I think the biggest intersection of news and Twitter was the, uh, the crackdown on the Iranian protesters during the election. It was inspiring to have that much news coming out, but the pitfalls was that it was unsubstantiated. And you had media outlets like CNN saying, here's a ton of stuff. We're not sure if it's true or not. What, you know, did that event inspire you? Do you feel like your service helped and was it, do you feel it was limited in some way? I just want to get your thoughts on it as we're all involved in the news here and I think that was the standout event of the year. Absolutely. Uh, it did all the above. It inspired us and it showed, it demonstrated a potential we thought was there. It demonstrated that earlier, especially in a, in a country where um, we're not that established. It, it showed, um, you know, some potential. And I've, having worked on, on Blogger before Twitter and technologies that allow more people to publish more information more freely, I've come to believe that that's a good thing for the world. And it's a good thing on a daily basis for, for people, you know, to say the Little Lake game is canceled, but um, once in a while you have these profound events that really show you the power, especially in, in places where, where information is not as freely distributed. And you know, seeing examples of that where it's, it's really changing things is extremely gratifying. Uh, however, what it mostly does for me is say, wow, we have so much to do because it's not, it's not substantiated, it's not easy enough for the people there, it's not easy enough for us here to, to understand it, know what's really going on. And so there's just a million things we need to do. One of them um, in regards to the, it being unsubstantiated is, is building, for a lot of reasons, we want to build more authenticity and, and trust into the network. It's great that right now it can be 
uh, anonymous, and in that case, actually, anonymity was really a, a key thing for some of the people there. Uh, so how do you have anonymity and trust is a really big question. In most cases, um, you probably don't want as much anonymity, and you want people to be able to develop um, identities that, that are useful. Um, but you can potentially have anonymity and trust. So we're actually working on, on things like reputation system to, to look at all the signals in the network and saying, well, this person, we may not know who they are, but there's some indication that they're trustworthy That's because great. these other people that are trustworthy trust this person, it looks like. Um, but that's sort of in, in the nascent stages, but it's definitely on our mind. Cool. Other questions? The other thing, by the way, while, while the mic's getting there is um, we're really excited about the potential of building location data into the network. We, we announced this recently, and I think we may be launching something today just to developers to uh, start building in location. So every, every tweet will have the potential to be tagged with a location. And so there's lots of applications already that have this ability. So iPhone apps or other uh, mobile apps can grab the location a user is at and at their discretion attach that to the tweet. And once that starts happening in wide numbers, then uh, you can imagine many, many more useful things come out of that. So if, if uh, a tweet is coming out of Iran or saying it's in Iran, um, and it's sent with, with a mobile phone that it's, it, there's probably still ways to fake it. There's certainly still ways to fake it, but um, being able to filter and discover information by location is, could be a really big deal for, for finding out what's happening there. I'm gonna jump in for a minute because yep. what you said just caught my interest. So launching lists and then having the ability to have location-based tweets really kind of suggests that part of the future direction for Twitter is to be the, um, the, the network that you're just talking about, but also to become more of an ecosystem, mm -hmm. to really have APIs that then can be integrated into other products and mm -hmm. create new products. Is that, right. that's a Absolutely. part of where you're, where, you're, where you're headed or what you're Absolutely. thinking? Absolutely. Um, yeah, and we've, we've been really fortunate with the ecosystem already, and we've had thousands of developers who have built uh, great apps for Twitter and interesting visualizations of Twitter content. Um, and uh, we're seeing lots of examples of that today in the recent, one of the most recent ones that goes back to earlier in the conversation about what you can do with this data is by using the API and um, kind of bubbling out the meaning. There's an interesting example a week or two ago during the, the Video Music Awards on MTV is they actually built a Twitter app that uh, sucked in all the tweets that were about the VMAs or what was happening at the time and um, a local company here, Stamen Labs, created a visualization that um, showed the celebrities and the topics that were being most talked about at, up to the minute and you could see this on, on MTV's site and you could also, they also presented on the TV and um, that was all just by using our API. We had nothing to do with creating that it was just the users doing their normal thing, and then they were saying, oh, it looks like at this minute, a lot of people are talking about Kanye. I, I wonder why. And then it charted that. Uh, so all kinds of cool stuff like that. We're just seeing, we're seeing tons of examples of today, but we're also putting a lot of effort into um, supporting, you know, adding capabilities to the API and it, making it easier to use. Um, Chloe, who I mentioned, is, is also working with third parties. She worked on that MTV thing to help in, to hook them up with third parties. So a lot of, we know a lot of media organizations could do awesome stuff with this data if it was easy enough. And um, we want to make it a lot easier. And there's also third party d development houses who can, mm -hmm. who can work um, in conjunction with media companies to, to provide the technology. So just to footnote that quickly, um, people here are interested in data visualization. Stamen Design did the uh, Oakland crime spotting of the San Francisco crime spotting maps and they have a contract to do um, mapping for the Olympics in 2012 and they're a very cutting edge design company so I'm, I'm kind of thrilled to hear that, that they partnered with you guys because I yeah. think their interfaces are so great. Yeah, they're fantastic. Other questions? I think there's a mic in the back. Okay. Yes. Right? Oh, right there. 
Okay. Um, I have an, an observation and then a quick question. I was a charter member of the USA Day Today staff. I was there several months before it actually began to publish in, uh, in September of 1982. And your sort of guidelines for building a business um, are, are diametrically opposed to how they did it. And I guess that's just another sign of the times. They, they did market research out the wazoo, and of course you can hardly start a national newspaper small. Um, and you might be cheered to hear they didn't make money for years. <laughs> My question is simply, um, I, I think, and I'm, I, most people do, that Twitter and Tweet are two of the most brilliant branding uh, words out there, and I just wonder how you guys came up with those. Um, it's a good question. We got really lucky with, with the branding uh, and the name. The name was thought of by uh, the co-founder of Odeo, Noah Glass, who worked on Twitter very early um, when it was a side project there. And uh, I think we're, we're trying to figure out something that kind of connoted the, the feeling we had. The, we had the product and we were testing it amongst ourselves before we had the name. And, and we mostly use it through SMS and, mm -hmm. and we'd have our phone in our pocket and it would vibrate and be a, be a, a Twitter message. And he thought, what is that? What is that? And it kind of makes you twitch. And, <laughs> He looked up and it was like Twitch and, and Twitch in the dictionary and Twitter was right below it. I haven't checked if that's true. <laughs> so Twitch didn't have the most positive connotations, but, but <laughs> Twitter, and then Twitter turned out to be a word that meant you know, birds talking and, and um, then we stumbled on the bird thing and which led to tweet. And we actually didn't think of tweet either. Like so many things with Twitter, uh, it's something that the, that the users came up with. And I don't know who started calling them tweets, but it was brilliant. And at first, like a lot of things users come up with, we were like, nah, that's not right. It's not tweet, it's Twitter. <laughs> and uh, then, then we embraced it. We, we realized that was brilliant. Now we call them tweets instead of status updates. <laughs> question that someone sent in who wasn't here, um, Chad Gapelman, which was, um, have you thought about changing the status box from what are you doing uh, to something else? Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, that, is, that has evolved a lot. So uh, Twitter has changed a lot about, not in the product itself, but how we think about it. So status updates was a reflection of, uh, we thought it was about status. It's updating your status. Um, so what are you doing is the natural question for your status. And uh, we moved a lot uh, far from that now. And we only recently changed our homepage finally to not say, you know, Twitter's about updating your friends and coworkers about what are you doing. And we just put the search box there and we, we put the trends there. And we really see it much more now as as finding out what's happening and sharing what's happening in, in real time. And so what are you doing is sort of definitely a legacy question that doesn't fit as well with how we think about Twitter and how most users think about Twitter, I believe. It was very useful early on to, although it could be used for anything, to kind of frame it and say, what, what the heck do I do with this thing? Well, answer the question, what are you doing? But it also potentially trivializes what you do with it. Um, so, so many people have said, well, who cares what, what you had for breakfast and why is Twitter important? So I think we should change it to what did you have for breakfast, actually. <laughs> um, but we'll see. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have time maybe for one or two more. It's a really good one. <laughs> Hi, I'm at Corey Hike with at Seattle Times, and <laughs> hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm just wondering, because I have to deal with this a lot, how do you deal with, Twitter is so ridiculous. What is your <laughs> response to that? <laughs> it's silly. What yeah. are you doing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's sort of... We, know, we should have a much better question to why, why people should care, um, but then they eventually do anyway, so I get less stressed out about that question than I used to. It's funny, the same exact thing happened with Blogger and blogging in, in 2000. It's like, why would anyone do this, and what, what makes people think that anyone care what the, cares what they have to say? Um, why are they filling up the web 
uh, with this stuff. Um, and eventually just realized, well, it doesn't matter um, whether people are questioning it, but it's not a very good marketing <laughs> strategy on my part. Um, so we're trying to get better at that. What, what I think, what, what we think is the, the path to helping people understand why, why Twitter is important is to really focus on not just creating um, and you know, telling the world what you're doing. That, that's what turns a lot of people off. It's like, why, why would I want to do that? But if you focus on what you can find out through Twitter that makes you smarter or faster or more efficient or tunes you in to, to topics or people that you care about, um, then that makes a lot of sense to people. And one thing we want to get a lot better at, which Liz attributes to, is, is helping people find the stuff that they care about. But at this point, for almost anyone, there's stuff on Twitter that they care about, um, whether it's sports or news or politics or, or their friends, then there's stuff, if they could find it, they'd be like, oh, great. And um, I would love to look at this stuff. And that actually we realized was the same thing with, with blogging as well. The way to get people blogging wasn't to show them um, on blogger.com, Here, here's a box, start typing in it. It was to show them some blogs and, and then they start reading. Maybe they even start commenting and then they may blog. Of course, many more people read than write still and that may be true with Twitter eventually as well. But um, the most successful thing we've done is, is go to the search box and say, oh, what are you interested in? Are you basketball? Here, let's look what Shaq's saying right now. Um, that's kind of cool for people. Cool. Uh, one last question, I think. I got one for the web. So this question comes from Andrew Nystrom at the LA Times. He says, uh, tough question for Ev. If Twitter scrubs geolocation data after 14 days, but developers allowed to cache it, who will be liable for subpoenas? Whoa. <laughs> you know the answer I, to that, of course, I think right? I might, might need my lawyer here. Uh, um, I'm not sure. I think that what that re is referring to is we, we said that we weren't going to keep historical location data. Um, at least at first, that's our plan because um, there's a lot of data that, that we don't want to be responsible for. But um, you know, phone companies have all the location data anyway, and they get thousands of subpoenas a day, and they give over this information. So I'm not sure if we'll be a huge target because it'll probably be more efficient to go to them. Um, but this is an area that I don't know nearly enough about, so I'll shut up now. Was. Well, I hope everybody will join me in thanking Ev. Um, I think this has been a great conversation. Thank you very much. My pleasure.